Well, welcome to the London School of Economics. Um, thank you very much for braving the rain. Um, my name's Neil Lee. I'm from the Department of Geography and Environment, um, and I'm also an affiliate of the International Inequalities Institute, who are putting on tonight's lecture. Um, and we're very, very pleased to welcome Professor Danny Dawling um, from the University of Oxford, where he is Halford Mackinder Professor of Geography. Now, Danny is a leading figure in both geography and I guess, the study of inequalities more generally. When I started at the LSE, I put together a reading list, and as part of this reading list, I had a lecture on inequality, and I sent it to my head of department, and she said, there's not enough Danny Dawling on this. Um, there were three pieces, three pieces by, by Danny Dawling. Um, he has 15,000 Google Scholar citations, which is the sort of indicator academics care about. Um, 15,000 this morning, so it'll be more. Um, and his CV comes in at about 95 pages long um, of achievement. Just to put this in context, my CV comes in at four pages. Um, so that's inequality for you. But <laughs> Danny, Danny's done a sort of wonderful job, um, sort of, I guess, publicizing the issues around inequality and studying them over a number of years. And he has produced a timely and important book, um, which he will be talking about today, The Equality Effect. And it's a great read. I would recommend you um, all buy it. And you will be able to at the end of the session when copies will be for sale at the back. And then Danny will be um, able to sign them. Um, it's a really great read. I'm literally chairing this event so that I get a free copy. Um, <laughs> it's, been, it's been absolutely worth it. It's been absolutely worth it. So there's a few, um, a few sort of little bits of housekeeping. First is that there is a Twitter hashtag for those of you on Twitter, which is LSE Dawling. So LSE Dawling for the Twitter hashtag. Could you put your phones onto silent? And if you're not going to be sort of tweeting about it, probably just switch your phone off would be the best thing. Danny's going to speak for about 40 minutes, 45 minutes. Um, and then we will have plenty of time for questions. And it would be great to sort of to get some really sort of interesting and challenging questions for him. So without any further ado, Danny, thank you very much. Uh, thank you ever so much for coming. Uh, this is going to be quite an upbeat lecture, and you may be wondering as I start going through this, uh, how on earth can he be as optimistic and as upbeat as he's going to be, um, given the kind of things that are going on at the moment? And part of the reason is that we are the most unequal country in Europe, and if everything was fine here, then equality wouldn't be such a great thing. But because things are so awful in the UK, it helps to provide the evidence about how bad economic inequality is and how much better it is uh, to be a bit more equal. If you're trying to look for something to help lift your spirits at the moment, we are actually providing the evidence as a country to the rest of Europe of what goes wrong if you let the rich take more and more and more. Um, one other thing I should say, um, if you have a, have a little look under your chair at the moment, does anybody notice any rubbish, anything? I mean, somebody's found some, not so good. But in general, it's fairly clean, isn't it? Yep, yep, somebody's, somebody's made sure it's fairly clean. Uh, that's the LSE cleaners. Um, we should point out the reason why we have disputes, such as the dispute going on uh, here at the moment, is because we have the kind of inequalities we have at the moment. If I was giving this lecture in a university in Switzerland, the people cleaning the university would be paid three times more per hour than the people here. But we're used to inequalities. We think uh, they're normal. And I, I did that because Owen Jones didn't turn up yesterday to a, a talk here. But he's here today because he wrote the foreword for this book. For that. Um, what does the book do? It's really about what have we learned in the last 10 years about inequality and equality that we didn't know 10 years ago. Now, 10 years ago is when we first began to realize that there were grave societal outcomes if you put up with high economic inequalities. Uh, the book which explained that was called The Spirit Level. It was the best-selling book in this country, I think, in social science for a decade. Um, but that was 10 years ago. The weakest piece of information in the spirit level was that life expectancy appeared to be related to inequality. That was one of the ones that academically they got attacked for more than others. That was the weakest correlation. 
since the spirit level was written, of all the countries in Europe, and there are a lot in Europe, only one country has seen no increase in life expectancy, and that's us. That's the United Kingdom, the most unequal country. There is a more unequal country in the rich world, that's the United States, and conveniently, they've seen life expectancy fall, just to help build on the evidence. Conversely, in Finland and Norway, life expectancy since 2011 has risen by an entire year to 2015. The same in Japan. So we're beginning to see evidence that the idea that inequality is bad for you is not some fanciful set of correlations that appeared at one time, but is becoming reinforced. Uh, if you've got very good eyesight, you can see the set of quotes on the back of the book. They were not quotes which were commissioned for the book. Uh, they are Barack Obama, the president of China, the head of the IMF. And finally, this January, the world business leaders at Davos saying that inequality is a really, really bad thing. The world business leaders at Davos didn't have much of a solution to offer, but, but they had, they had recognised that it was a threat uh, to them. The upside of this is what are the good things you get from being more equal? And a more hopeful, more positive way of talking at, about this is to look at the benefits rather than to always obsess about the negative side. No country is truly equal. The most equal countries in the world still have pay ratios between the best off tenth and the poorest tenth of something like five to one. They look a bit like this. Uh, this cartoon was drawn by Ella Furness, who's done a series of cartoons, cartoons for the book. But what happens in a more equal country is that people at the top see people at the bottom as human beings. In an unequal country, you begin to not see them as human beings because it's very hard to get through the day if you do because you might begin to worry about how they're being treated, what's happening. We learn in this country, or we've learned again in this country, how to walk past people on the streets who are begging for small amounts of money. When I was growing up, there was nobody begging for small amounts of money uh, in this country. How do I manage to get through London? I don't look at the people who are begging for money. And that's because of the country I'm now living in. You don't have to concern yourselves with these things in more equal countries. I was doing a talk in a school recently and talking about ending homelessness. And one of the children in the school said, well, you can never end homelessness. It will always be there. And I realised that he'd grown up in a country where there had always been homeless people on the streets. So you need hope. You need to realise that things can be different. Uh, I've got a few of these far too complicated graphs, but they're simply to back up the statement I'm going to make. Um, this is something else that we didn't know 10 years ago because it wasn't the case 10 years ago. One reason that we've become so interested in equality is that it reached particular heights in particular countries. Without the evidence of the last 30 years, we couldn't have known that inequality was as harmful as we now know it is. And if all the countries of the rich world had become, become similarly unequal, we wouldn't have known either. The only reason we know is that we have a natural experiment where some countries, and you can see the ones with the short bars, are much more equal, and other countries, which in the richest part of the world is always the USA, UK and Israel, are the most unequal. And in this case, you've got Latin American countries as, as well. Um, according to the OECD, who calculated Gini coefficient of inequality, majority of OECD countries recently have seen inequalities fall. Very narrow majority but it's majority. Harder to prove, that's easy to prove, harder to prove is I think we have seen an incredible change in moral sentiment in recent years. When we now see somebody paying money for a number plate that says rich one for their car, we pity them. Majority of us pity them. We, we're not impressed. It's not something that you would think, haven't they done well? That was not the case in 1995, 96 and 97. Back then, the press would have stories about bankers working not far from here, celebrating a particular deal by buying a bottle of champagne for £10,000. You no longer hear any of those kind of stories. The kind of stories you hear now, which you dismiss quite quickly, 
are that the new commissioner of the Metropolitan Police is going in on a salary 40,000 less than her predecessor. And you just think, well, of course she is. That's sensible. You don't think that's quite an incredible thing to, to have occurred. We are not impressed by people becoming very rich anymore. A majority of us were quite impressed just a decade ago. My claim here is that the same thing is occurring as occurred in the 1930s. There's a change in the moral sentiment of what is seen as right. Uh, my favourite bit of evidence came from this morning. I had a spare hour and a half. I read the Conservative Party manifesto. <laughs> um, it doesn't quite say for the many, not the few, but it might as well say it. Um, and I'm sure that they don't mean it. But the fact that they have to say it repeatedly, a meritocracy, although, of course, we know how bad a meritocracy is, those of us who know where the word comes from, but the fact that the Conservative Party manifesto is full of this agonising about trying not to be nasty, rather than celebrating people with aspiration who've created the wealth. Um, I, d I didn't search it uh, electronically, but I didn't spot the word wealth creator at all in the Conservative Party manifesto. When the sentiment changes, political parties move direction. From the late 1970s onwards, the sentiment became more and more right-wing. Our political parties every year took a step to the right, all of them. The Conservative Party ended up so far to the right, it could no longer be a member of the Conservative Parties of Europe. It had to join a weird alliance with some Polish Law and Justice Party of strange extremists. Our Labour Party moved so far to the right um, that it didn't look like any social democratic party in the rest of Europe. The Liberals moved to the right. All that's happened since the crash is that Labour have taken a couple of steps, not that many. Labour have taken a couple of steps back towards the left towards becoming more of a normal left-wing mass European party. And the Conservatives are actually doing the same. There is compulsory purchase of land to build social housing in the Conservative Party manifesto. Now, maybe they won't do it, but the fact that that is in there you can see the shifts beginning to happen. Now, that kind of shift has to carry on for 30 years for us to become normal, because it took 30 years for us to become as abnormal as we became. Here's another one of these graphs. This is from UNDP. It's the quintile income ratio of the countries UNDP say are the richest in the world. And there's been huge uh, successes in Latin America, but again, if you were to look carefully, you'll see that in the majority of these rich countries, the ratio of the incomes of the best off fifth to the poorest fifth have fallen between 2004 and 2013. Equality is increasing in more places than it is decreasing. Thomas Piketty is not correct about mass pessimism, um, which is good news. Don't know why. But people in most countries are managing to begin to control the rich better than they were. And it isn't just 2008, 2009. We're becoming more aware of the kind of absurdities of putting water into glass bottles while other people still don't have enough water that they can drink. When the general sentiment and attitude changes, it's very hard to show it's changed because it changes for all of us. So you don't feel that a change has occurred. But if I had a way of moving you back into time and taking you and putting you in this country 10 years, 12 years ago and walking around, you would see that people were behaving in a different way. Then it was all about more and more economic growth. And what's the problem with the rich as long as they pay their taxes? That kind of thing. Whereas now the problem is we've got a massive problem of the rich not paying their taxes. And we know that. Last one of these, the poorest countries in the world. The data is much, much worse. There are people still moving off subsistence farming, but the record in the poorest countries of the world is actually better than in the richest countries in the world in terms of inequality reducing for the only data we have, which is the UNDP data. 
Milanovic's elephant, which if you don't know, I'm afraid I haven't got enough time to explain it, um, but perhaps the, the most famous graph in the world about worldwide income inequalities is a graph which is largely about equalisation. We concentrate on the poorest in the world because they haven't improved, that's the tail of the elephant. And of course we concentrate about us, which is the world's upper middle class who have not done particularly well. And we concentrate about the trunk. But the vast world bulk of the world population are seeing their income rise percentage-wise, not absolutely percentage-wise, more than others, and becoming more similar to each other. We're getting a world middle class slowly appearing. But a world middle class that is also a world working class. In a very, unequal, a very equal country like Japan, you can't differentiate between middle and working class. It is the same thing. These graphs are far too many for you to be able to see, but they are the 23 countries, I think, uh, which the World Income and Wealth Database now has decent records over some time in terms of the take taken by the top 1%. And they generally look U-shaped, although I'll be showing you a few in a minute which show that they don't all go U-shaped. But if you look at the very end, you'll see that the share of the 1% in many cases, actually in most cases, is finally falling. Now, whether that continues or not, we don't know. But to sit where you're sitting and to think inequality is rising and rising and there's nothing we can do about it or not much, it really is looking very bad news, is to ignore the data that we didn't know about 10 years ago. It doesn't have to rise forever. The world today looks very similar to the world around about 1913, 1970 the previous kind of inequality peaks. But nobody then, they didn't even know they were at an inequality peak because nobody had measured inequality back then. Hugh Gateskill did his PhD on it and found it hard to measure. Inequalities fell in the 1920s and they fell very rapidly in the 1930s, but nobody knew they were falling in the 1930s. It just felt absolutely awful. And it, I'm afraid the bad news is, even if we do see the kind of reduction in inequalities that we may be beginning to see, it's not going to feel great for 20 years at the rate of improvement that we're currently seeing and at the rate that we've had before. But our children, and absolutely, definitely our grandchildren, will be living much, much better lives if the trends that may have begun continue. It is possible for it to happen. Uh, zooming in a little bit, here's Germany and Japan. Uh, it's not entirely our fault that we're the most unequal country in Europe. We had the misfortune of not being invaded in the Second World War. Um, the, the fastest way to become a more equal country is to lose a war. Uh, the invading force uh, destroys the elite of the country that they have invaded so that it doesn't happen again. In the case of Japan, which is the most extreme, the Americans rec requisitioned the land off the aristocracy in Japan and distributed it as equally as they could to create the world's most equal country, to create as a natural experiment in what happens. And we're still seeing the results of that today. The fact that life expectancy is still rising a third of a year a year, despite the fact it's the highest in the world, shows what that can do. I've zoomed in on the, on the very end, and again, you've got France and the UK there as well. Look at how different France and the UK are, by the way. The French made different decisions in the 1970s and 80s to us. Those different decisions had wide-ranging effects. I would argue that they led to a country in the terms of France where leading politicians had to talk to their populations as adults. If you look at how the leadership contenders in the recent French election discussed things with the electorate, they treated them as adults. Even Le Pen treated them as adults. Whereas our politicians don't treat us as adults. They just repeat, strong and stable, strong and stable, strong and stable. And my suggestion, I can't prove this, is that we've been dumbed down by rising inequality. Um, I'm going to show it you with education in a minute, but I can't prove it overall. But I think you have far more... Grown up, I hate that phrase, grown up politics, which is a phrase used here, but 
far more sensible, nuanced discussions about things in more equal countries. Not just because the population is actually far better educated and knowledgeable, but because you don't have fears of each other's and other people that stoke up in unequal countries. Um, if you f are finding it hard to accept this kind of disparaging of the UK, just think about the USA, right? Trump can only talk about building a wall and making somebody else pay for it because the population of the USA has been downgraded in its ability to understand things and messages over time. And we are the equivalent in Europe to the USA worldwide. Uh, now, if I was to say this in the United States, you're far more polite. Um, you could see the kind of anger that would, that would emerge. But the great news, if you look at the end for France and the UK, is again, you see the 1% taking less. The UK has had the biggest drop in the take of the 1% of any of these countries. But nobody has celebrated this. Uh, and the reason we haven't celebrated it uh, is that we've got a little suspicion, more than a suspicion, that what actually happened around about 2010, 2011, is that when Gordon Brown put the top rate of tax up to 50% for a very short amount of time, lots of people in the 1% created companies. And we know they created companies because there was a massive increase in companies. Companies with no employees. Companies which would then pay tax at a far lower rate. It just became marginally worthwhile if you're on an income of 170 or 180 or 190,000 pounds to do this. And we've had a culture since 2010, 11 of higher tax avoidance by people at the top. So we can't be sure that's a good thing. But the fact that they feel the need to hide their income is a good thing. And of course, it's entirely possible to tax people and avoid avoidance. It really is not that hard to have a tax system that works. You just have to look to more equal countries to see how to do it. The country which does it best is Sweden, where if your neighbour gets a new car and you're a little bit suspicious of your neighbour, you can look up their tax record to see how much tax they've paid. You can look up anybody's tax record. Right? That helps reduce tax avoidance. Our tax system in this country is just a gift to people who want to avoid tax. It is ridiculously easy. And that's even just the legal side of setting up your dodgy company, let alone the forgetting to mention something on your, your self-declared taxation form. Uh, I'm guessing you know that social mobility is high in countries which are more equal because there's much less at stake. We have numerous social mobility commissions now and the Conservative Manifesto is all about how to increase social mobility. You can't do it without increasing equality, right, for lots of reasons, because people care about their children. Uh, but we can go into that in questions, because I want to get through these in time. We do have a rising sense of unfairness. We're no longer suckered in the way we were 10 years ago by any remnants of the trickle-down theory that it was okay for the rich to get more, we will somehow get that. We would not have learned that without the crash and without the advocacy about inequality that there has been, saying it is not good for us. Right. We have actually learned, learned from this. Ability. Uh, this is my favorite little graph from Pisa, and I show it too often, but uh, this is a graph of people's ability at maths, standardised international maths test. Not taken when you normally take it at age 15 or 16 when you do GCSEs in this country. When there is a correlation, the more unequal countries, children do worse at maths than in the more equal countries. Um, but this one's taken at age 24 when it really lines up nice and straight. And what's happened in the UK and the USA over time, although I don't have data from the 1970s, but... I'm fairly sure you didn't have this in the 1970s. I don't think we are genetically destined not to be good at maths, and this is something that's always happened. What's happened in the UK and the USA as inequalities have risen and risen and risen is that parents and schools and teachers have become more and more obsessed by exam results. And so you do whatever you need to do to get your child an A star or an A at maths because it, it, you think will change which Russell Group University they might get into. Or for most average people, you desperately try to get your child a C, or whatever it is, grade six, 
has changed this year. Any paranoid parents out there of 15-year-olds? Yeah, but you know it matters if you are one. And so parents and the schools and everybody else do whatever they can to get children the highest grades at the point they're examined, and even more so with cramming in the United States. That doesn't teach you maths. Getting an A star at maths doesn't mean you're good at maths. We find this very hard to understand because we've had decades of saying high exam results mean you're good at a subject. This tells you, this graph tells you it means you're not good at maths. It means you're good at answering maths questions on a particular day of a maths exam. And we learn it in such a way that you maximize your results then, but you don't enjoy maths, you don't learn it. And the same graph can be seen for literacy and problem solving. It is terrible, the dumbing down effect that happens in more unequal countries. These things are a series of correlations, and I'm going to show you some more uh, dodgy, is probably the correct technical word, dodgy ones in a minute. Um, they're not correlations because one thing directly causes another. There's no way in which people wake up in the United States check the daily inequality rate and decide that they're going to drive to work that day. Right? This isn't that inequality, in this case, causes people to drive more cars. What happens is that in more equal countries, or countries that have become more equal, or countries like the Netherlands that have managed to stop becoming less unequal, people are more pro-social. They believe in the state more, they believe in active collectively more, and in the Netherlands, they design their transport systems and their housing systems so it's possible for 50% of the population to walk and cycle to work. Whereas in the United States, it's only 3%. The strength of some of these correlations suggests that you cannot have a green transport system in an unequal country. It isn't possible to do. The one there which is um, slightly out of kilter is Japan. Why is Japan slightly low for walking or cycling? Because people in Japan, when they're asked how they get to work, tick the train and don't say they actually walk to the train station or cycle to the train station, um, but they do. Other things that we didn't know 10, 10 years ago. And again, when I say this is dodgy, it's because we've only had two sets of data for this at two time points recently and they change a bit too fast to suggest that all the data is that good on meat eating in this case. But in more unequal countries, people eat more meat. Why do they eat more meat? They have meat advertised at them more. Uh, in the USA, 4% of GDP is spent on advertising. In Japan, it's 1%. But also, we comfort eat more in more unequal countries because we're more stressed. Uh, and once other people begin to eat more, particularly eat more meat, it becomes normal to do that. Eating lots of meat is not particularly good for you. There are always outliers on these graphs. There are lots of these graphs in the book. Uh, and the outliers are the most interesting thing. In this case, it's New Zealand and Australia that shouldn't be eating as much meat as they do, but they kind of have a ready supply. Um, five years ago, it was Denmark misbehaving uh, with bacon. Um, so it, mo it moves around a bit. Water. Water consumption. Personal domestic water consumption. We're the outlier. Uh, which might simply be very bad data collection from Thames Water, is my suspicion. I would nationalise it. But anyway, um, <laughs> Wonderful private company, Thames Water. If you ever want to laugh, have a look at their balance sheet. And then when you don't want to stop laughing, think, what's going to happen when that goes wrong about your sewer system in London? <laughs> it's, it's not great. Um, it might not be Thames Water simply not measuring it rightly. We're not a very good cu country for having a swimming pool in. Although, if you fly into London, you'll see that we do have quite a lot of swimming pools in Britain. Uh, there's nobody in them, you know. But one problem about becoming more unequal is that you get a few more richer people, and what do you do with the money? You put a swimming pool in your back garden. Or in London, I've been into houses in Mayfair, three-bed house in Mayfair, going for 20 million, where somebody had put a swimming pool in a sub-basement. Um, there's nothing I think you can do to a house to make it more of a death trap, really. Um, and I do wonder whether people will realise in the future. The kind of thing that's going on here, and you see it most clearly in the United States, is basically increased selfishness. 
in more unequal countries, what you want is what matters. So in rich counties in California, when there's a drought and they put fines on and say you can't water your gardens, you can't fill your swimming pools, a disproportion of people say, sod you, I should be free to do what I want. And they fill their swimming pool and they water their garden and they pay the fine because they don't care about other Americans because they're not like them. They're not the same people. Uh, the y-axis is, is wrongly labelled on this graph. This is actually the amount of waste that people produce a year. And again, we've only had this data at two points in time. I'm showing the most recent data. And again, the data moves around a bit, suggesting that we haven't calculated waste that well. But the USA produces far more waste. By the way, if you're thinking these graphs would only work with the USA, <laughs> you'd be largely right. Um, but... If you take the 50 states of the USA and draw them all on as small circles, which I haven't done at this point, that's what comes next, you'll see that they beautifully extend the distribution. And you have 70 circles, and it's even stronger then. But this helps us look at the outliers. And the outliers, in this case, are Denmark and Switzerland. And my guess about Denmark and Switzerland is that they've actually got better at measuring waste because they're more concerned and greener. And this is why this is the boring academic side of this. Right. And this is why it's only very recently we've begun to see these things. Why does waste matter? Because it's a direct measure of consumption. Everything you buy, apart from jewellery and food, will go into your waste bins within a short amount of time. In more unequal countries, people can be convinced that they need to buy and throw away more. In more equal countries, people are more sensible, more clever. They're not poorer. They could buy more if they need but you don't need to keep on buying as much. It's far harder to dupe people in more equal countries, to go shopping, to buy clothes that they'll only wear three times. It's far easier in an unequal country to do that. And also you have much higher status anxiety in unequal countries. So you worry about what you're wearing. You worry about what's in your house. You worry about the size of your TV and is it big enough? The poor in the United States have very large TVs for a reason. People in more equitable countries have TVs of the kind of size that it makes sense to look at a TV because they don't have to worry about who they are and how other people might see them as much. Less than 10 minutes to go, you're shuffling around. It's not just aggregation of the more rich people you have, the worse things are. The poor consume more and behave worse in more unequal countries, but the rich are truly awful. Uh, the... <laughs> And this is data from Piketty and colleagues and done with Oxfam. Uh, on the carbon footprint of the top 10% and then the top 1%, it's unbelievably high. If you want to stop the planet burning up, you reduce inequality. You reduce inequality and the 1%, there's always a 1%, remember. This is, so I'm being slightly condescending. But in a more equal country, you wouldn't have to explain there's always a 1%. There's always a 1%. The question is how the 1% behave. The 1% in Germany travel by train. The 1% in the United States, or at least the top half of them, will much prefer to travel by plane, preferably their own private plane. Right? That's the fastest way to pollute. I think it has wider and worse effects. I think Germany took in a million people from Syria, not just because the 13-year-old girl made Angela Merkel cry, but because it is easier in a more equal country to see that you treat other people, refugees, better. And I think the reason why we've taken so few children is related to our degree of inequality. It makes it easier for us not to be compassionate. I can't prove that, but I've got the horrible feeling it's true. I can, I haven't got it here, but I can show you that far-right voting is wonderfully correlated with inequality. The more inequality in the country, the higher the voting for the far right. There are two exceptions, and they're not that big. Germany votes slightly less far right than it ought to, for very obvious historical reasons. And France votes a little bit more far right than it should do, but not that much. This correlation only works, though, if you define voting for Donald Trump last year as voting for a far right party. But if you look at the statements Donald Trump made, then I think you can say 
in effect that was voting for a far right party. And the more unequitable a state in the, in the United States, the higher the vote for Trump. You can see why I don't do lectures in the United States, <laughs> by the way. Um, there are many other claims made in the books. Uh, they're not always completely safe, but there are correlations with fertility. People have more children in more unequal countries. They need an extra child for security. Uh, it doesn't work in Latin America, but elsewhere it works. The United States has the most children per adult in the rich world. It is the least uh, safe place. Fertility falls uh, in places like Japan. You can bolster it in Sweden with pro-natal policies and so on up to 1.8. But in general, and again this matters worldwide, if you would rather live in a world, or you'd rather your grandchildren lived in a world with 9 or 10 billion people and the population falling, rather than 11, 12 or 13 billion people, then you want the world to keep on heading towards greater equality, which it has just begun to start to do. Um, the other things that create more children are disasters, wars, uh, pestilence, famine. You want to avoid those, but you want to avoid the general insecurity that comes from inequality. People feel safer having smaller families when they live in a society that look after them, not in a society that says you look after yourself. And if you happen to get dementia, well, that's down to you, which was today's news. Imagine living in a country that said that we will look after you no matter what happens to you. Then do you need an extra son or daughter just in case? These are the kind of things that might be subconscious, but when you begin to look at the patterns across, you see that people are having more children where there is greater precarity. We become acclimatized to hardship. This graph, the orange line, is showing the incredible rise in people becoming homeless because their assured short hold tenancy is simply ended by their landlord. And we don't see that as a great social evil, not yet. Um, but that is now the main reason why you're getting increased homelessness in Britain. A landlord simply wants to get a better paying set of tenants in. And people allow others to dominate themselves more under great inequality. Uh, people are much more likely to say that democracy isn't necessarily a good thing in more unequal countries. The highest rate of people saying that democracy is vital is in Scandinavia. The lowest rate is in the United States. Strong and stable leader. <laughs> right? Under inequality, that's what you want. Right? The great leader knows best. In a more equal country, the idea that a single individual matters that much, of course it's stupid. But in an unequal country, you need something to cling on to. No matter how farcical it is that that one individual is such a wonderful person, or that another individual leading a political party might be such a liability that everything would fall apart if they were the leader, and not, in fact, that your political parties are run by a collection of people, which is, which is what happened in this country in the past. 1960s Labour governments set a cabinet ministers who were all able, not one strong leader who mattered so much. It's only great inequality that has led us to concentrate on individuals in this way. It affects us. This is the worst thing about us. It changes our own behavior. It makes us narcissistic. Right? Because that becomes common. It becomes okay to say, look at me, I'm great. It makes some of us overwork. It makes us do too much. Because you've got to kind of show off. It is not good. It is not necessarily good for those who achieve much and for the rich. We become attuned to being told that we should always want more, strive for more. Why have you only got two cars? Surely you want three cars. <laughs> At the last census, there were more families who had more cars than adults who could drive the cars than there were single parents without a car. And if you're a single parent, I think you really do actually need a car. So we had enough cars in the country. We're just increasingly unequally distributing things. There are lots and lots of ways out of this. Uh, some are more extreme than others, although there's no need to introduce them in their full-blooded form. 
this is a little graph of one of the basic income schemes that's been suggested. I think we've now got something like two dozen experiments on basic income going around the world at the moment. Um, this is showing how much it would cost to introduce a basic income in the UK. And the only people who'd lose out would be people in the top 10th, people like me, and people in the top 9th, and a tiny fraction in the top 8th. And all the people in the lower deciles and the blue ones are getting more. And if you look at that and you go, but the orange areas are really small and the blue areas are really big. How can you fund all the blue from the orange? Because our top 10th and our next 10th take so much. It really is not hard to reduce inequality. We've seen it before. And the minute you begin to reduce it, it becomes seen as normal to reduce it, which is why it fell all the way through from 1913 right to the middle 1970s. But the minute you begin to allow it to increase, you get a self-reinforcing pattern again. Or at least we did. They didn't in Switzerland and the Netherlands. It comes to something when you have to point to Switzerland and say, you know, imagine if we could do as well as the Swiss, where the 1% at some points has taken less than half of our 1%, and they have a banking sector. Um, but it just doesn't have to be the way it is in this country. The Netherlands is a better example. And yes, they've had little rises in inequality recently, but most recently, in both those countries, they have fallen. If you're wondering what you need to do to make our financial sector less greedy, then the best possible plan, although I didn't think about this at the time and I did vote Remain, but the best way to reduce the greed of our financial sector is to leave the EU possibly without passporting for banks and to watch banks begin to buy up buildings, in one case for Dublin last week, for 137 million one bank paid for one building. In Dublin and in Frankfurt and in Paris and in Munich and all over the continent. And then watch the bankers' salaries alter this year. Right, over three quarters of the highest paid bankers in Europe are in this city. And we say they have to be paid this much because otherwise they'd go somewhere else to work, even though, of course, they're paid much, much less everywhere else in Europe. And New York is full. There is no way the bankers' salaries are not going to fall, given that the banks are actually trying to get the bankers to move right now out of London. We tend to prioritise bad news, or at least a group of people I socialise with tend to prioritise bad news. Um, you know, so we're obsessed by what happens in the UK and what happens in the USA. Every time there's a good news vote or something else, we just kind of go, oh, well, that happened, but we don't remember it. We don't celebrate Trudeau winning in Canada. We don't celebrate the fascists not getting a majority in Austria. We go, oh, they came ever so close. Didn't get a majority. We don't celebrate the election in the Netherlands. And in particular, just a few months ago, I was talking with many people about what we would do if Le Pen won a majority in France. She gets nowhere near a majority in France. The French behave incredibly sensibly. And we just let it wash over us, and 24 hours later, we're looking for the next bad news story to worry about. The far right in recent years has seen almost as many falls as rises. There are large European countries with no far right party, but we don't look for the optimistic side of things, which is perhaps understandable given where we are and what's happening here. But you know, somebody had to be the most unequal country in Europe although it really ought to be a small European country by chance. It shouldn't have been a large one, but anyway, it does. Uh, when I was young, the great worry wasn't inequality, not least because we were the second most equal country to Sweden in Europe. The, wor the worry was that we were going to be annihilated from nuclear war. That's the decline in ballistic, intercontinental ballistic missiles. Um, that's what happens if women camp outside fences at Green and Common. I think that was how... You have to convince enough people in power that there's madness in this. Not everybody. There are still people in power who say they would happily kill hundreds of thousands of people. But quietly, the bulk of us know that that is psychopathic. And I should have carried that graph on because it's carried on falling. There were always good news stories. Sunday Times Rich List was a wonderful good news story. But if you bought the Sunday Times magazine, you wouldn't have 
read it. And if you looked at any of the reporting of Sunday Times, you wouldn't have seen it. The wealth of the richest 1,000 families in this country, or the 1,000 who are now the richest, because loads of them have dropped out in last year, rose by 82 billion in last year, or by 14%. So the rich are getting richer and richer and richer. But this is in pounds. A 14% rise in your wealth in pounds, if you're one of the richest families in the UK, means in real terms, you're not as well off as you were last year, because the pound has fallen. And the only reason why the wealth of the 1,000 families is as high as it is, is families whose wealth is largely held outside of the UK in dollars or other currencies that haven't fallen. Um, there are lots of stories I've put into the book about the rich. Not the eight richest people in the world, they are still a problem. But many falls in income in the rich. My favorite is a news story last year. The average CEO of a top American company last year saw their salary fall by a million dollars in one year. The average worker in the USA saw their salary increase by $900 a year. And those two things equal out. A million less for the CEO, another $900 for the average worker. Nobody reported that as a good news story. I was ecstatic because I'm a weird nerd. This is the first time in my life that there has been a fall in this ratio. But the really good news is the newspapers reported this as, isn't the gap absolutely terrible? Which is correct, it is. But it fell. And I do worry that we can be overly pessimistic. And it is understandable to be pessimistic. It was understandable when I was a child to think nuclear war was going to come, and it could have come. There are many, many bad things that could happen. But in general, almost all of them don't happen. Um, and this one is so solvable. This one is so much easier than climate change. This is my last slide, so please think of a question for me. The alternative to the way we are currently living is incredibly attractive. The alternative is not absolute equality. That doesn't exist anywhere. If you want to know what kind of inequality I'm in favour of, I'm in favour of a maximum 8 to 1 ratio. I can justify that for a few people. Um, but you can argue about 21. As it is, we have 300 to 1 ratios. The curved ladder that Ella's drawn there shows you the kind of country that we're living in. And it's a country where life is absolutely awful at the bottom. It really is worse than it was a decade, two decades, three decades ago. It's worse for the people on the streets. It's worse for the people who, who are going to food banks that we didn't have. But it's also worse in the middle, where young people are looking at de debts of 58 to 108,000 pounds just to go to university. And it's also worse higher up, where somebody clinging on at the top is looking down and thinking, if I get less, I will have to join them. My children will have to take out a student loan. 8% of students have free university education. Their parents pay their fees. If you want to know what's wrong with student loans, student loans allow the rich to pay as little as they can for university education because they can be lowly taxed and they simply pay the tuition fees for their students. But people high up in income in an unequal country have an absolute fear of going down. That fear is so high that unlike anywhere else in Europe, they will pay £35,000 a year to send their child to a boarding school. And that boarding school will force A's with the normal A stars, only the stupid ones get A's, will force those out of boys at the age of 15. And then it will force A star, A star A's out of them at A level. And then it will push them to go to a tiny number of universities, which if they fail to get into the top ones, they're already a failure at the age of 18. And it'll make them go and work for a degree, often in something like finance or law, irrespective of what they're interested in, because those are the only things that they can actually go into jobs that will pay them a salary that will be half what the 1% get at the age of 25 or 26 to be able to live the same kind of life as their parents. The rich are not free. In an unequal country, the rich are incredibly constrained. 
Imagine what happens if your parents are on an average salary between them of 200 to 250,000 pounds and you bring back a boyfriend or girlfriend from a normal family to have lunch at the weekend, right? You can't fall in love with just anybody in an unequal country. In this country back in the 90s and 60s and 1970s, you are much freer to mix with who you want, to do what you want, to choose what kind of job you'd be better at. You wouldn't be paid a fortune for doing any particular job and you wouldn't be punished greatly for doing another job. And we had near real full employment, not the kind of employment we have now, where employment rates are at a record high because our benefits are relatively so very low and we sanction people so incredibly if they try and live off these lowest benefits in Western Europe. This is an awful situation to be living in. Our politics has begun to move. It is moving slowly but steadily. The election is just a blip on these particular graphs. The good news is that the manifestos are moving to the left to where the manifestos were before. The good news is that our highest paid people are not going to be able to get those incomes in just a few years because we're not going to get Empire 2.0. We're not going to become the richest country in the world, which George Osborne promised us by the year 2030. We are not some special genetic set of people destined to rule. And that, so it's all going to be okay with Brexit. But how did we ever get the idea that we were this special? How did Boris Johnson come to think it? Not Boris's fault. He grew up in a very unequal country in which he was told that some people some cornflakes are especially gifted and will rise to the top. Things go terribly, terribly badly wrong when inequality rises. Things become much, much, much better as equality rises. Thank you very much. Well, that was wonderful stuff. I'm mean, sure we all have lots of questions. I mean, one of my questions, actually, is what you were doing in a three-bed house in Mayfair with a swimming pool. Um, but I think it might be sort of indiscreet to ask you that um, right now. So maybe I'll save that till afterwards. So we have people with microphones, I think, um, who can answer questions. So if we start off, should we start off with the gentleman with glasses? Uh, do you think that a wealth tax has any role to play in the reduction of inequality? Um, I'll try to keep my answer short. Uh, absolutely on property, uh, because it is incredibly hard to avoid. You, you can see it on Google Earth. Um, so that the wealth tax I would certainly begin to bring in is a fairer council tax to start off with. At the moment, for the property worth the same value in Kensington as opposed to Barking and Dagenham, you pay half. The, the, the wealth tax is actually half as much for the rich as it is for the poor on the same band property. And of course, the bands stop. Um, so we need to make our property tax at least flat. It's currently regressive. Um, and I suspect that might even happen under a Conservative government if it were to win on uh, June the 8th, because we're going to need to get money from, from somewhere. So I suspect we'll begin to see uh, changes on that. Uh, and then... The other taxes are transaction taxes on uh, selling financial goods very, very quickly, which Piketty advocates. That makes a lot of sense. But you have to be pragmatic about your taxes. Uh, the wealthy will try incredibly hard to hide their money. They're very scared of losing it. Uh, if you want to be really utopian, then you need to influence the country which gives sanctuary and protection to the world's tax havens. And you need to alter, and unfortunately, it's only one country that does this in the world that allows these small islands to hide the money of the rich. The good news is it's us. So if you want to make the entire world a fairer place, you need to affect who governs Britain. And if you want, to, in my mind, a reason, why have so many people, ever since James Goldsmith in 1997, why have so many very rich people paid so much money to the referendum party and then to UKIP to try to get this country out of Europe? It's because they do not want control of that kind of thing occurring. Um, but be pragmatic. Wealth taxes that will work. 
There was a question behind the gentleman with glasses, the woman in the check shirt. Uh, thank you very much for my questions about the university league tables. So uh, recently the Guardian released um, that Cambridge University was at the top of the league table, but if you look at, uh, it, at Cambridge University in terms of well-being and access, it's uh, much further down. If you had to come up with an index to measure the performance of universities, what, would the, what factors would you use to measure them? Oh, <laughs> that is tricky, that, to be short. Um, the first thing to say is slightly... University league tables are rather like football league tables. You know, they don't hold to that much over time. And to be honest, if you're producing a university league table and you're the people in Singapore who do it or the Times Higher or the Guardian, you have to produce a league table that puts Oxford and Cambridge at the top. Otherwise, your league table won't be taken seriously. Um, that's not uh, that I'm saying Oxford and Cambridge are particularly good. I'm saying, in a way, short term, we can't lose. Um, and that's partly why we're at the top. Uh, I would like to move to what's normal in the rest of this continent and Scotland, what is much more normal in the United States, what is more normal in Japan, apart from the University of Tokyo and Kyoto, um, and no league tables for university. Uh, you simply have a very good, decent local university for every city. This is, here, this is, you know, hippie dreaming. In the rest of the rich world, this is normality. Um, and a good university in your city is one in which local children go to. And if you teach in it, you are teaching your and your friend's children. And that would alter your attitude to the kind of teaching you're doing. Whereas my worry about the way we do things in Britain, about moving people around so much, is that I haven't felt so guilty about the fact we're charging £9,000 to students in the various universities I've worked in, because they're not my children, they're not the children of people I know, because we have a system of dislocated education at the university level. And we can only have that because of the strange country that we have become. Um, and we, it's very odd that we think that this is good and normal. But I'm, st I'm stuttering on this, because you can imagine a heresy in my own university. <laughs> Uh, where the ethos is that we exist to take the very cleverest children from everywhere. Now, how can that ethos exist? It can only exist if you think that human beings vary dramatically in their ability and potential. And there are a small number of golden children out there who, if you capture them and bring them in and educate them, then one day they will stand for election next to a stone with five pledges carved on it and embarrass <laughs> themselves. Or one day they will decide it's a good idea to have a referendum and turn out to be the worst prime minister since the war. Well, it's a ridiculous ethos that we live under in this country, but it is understandable because of where we have found ourselves uh, to be. But a, a good university for every city that local children can choose to go to. Still some freedom to move away, but the idea that you should seek to p position yourself exactly on a league and be with your peers with their potential in some kind of brave new world where you're going to be sorted alpha, beta, gamma. You know, we'd learnt when Aldous Huxley wrote that book that that was a bad idea. We'd become a much better country by the 60s and 70s. We had pride in different universities. And it was as inequality rose again that we began to believe in university league tables more and more and more. This country, a few years ago, had 30 universities which on their first page of their website claimed to be a top 10 university in the UK. <laughs> if you look at the university websites of most U European mainland universities, there is none of the embarrassing advertising that you see at the front of our uh, university web pages. Wonderful. More questions? If we go with the women in the front row, and then I'll start moving back. Thank you very much for a stimulating uh, presentation. Uh, I'm going to talk as a woman now. Um, I'm always worried when people talk about statistics of fertility, and I would prefer you to talk about statistics of birth rate. Uh, in Japan, for example, they were quite late in allowing women to have oral contraceptives. So that influenced the birth rate. Now they have it. And that, I believe, has been 
part of the reason for the reduced birth rate and part of the reason is that women have to work and people need two jobs in a family. So how can we encourage the term birth rate, not fertility? Um, yep, you're, you're completely right. Whether I manage it, <laughs> to, to change my language is hard, because uh, I was partly brought up in demography where we're stuck with this word. Um, but you know, you're right, because it's a silly word uh, to use for what I'm actually talking about. Um, there are other reasons in, in Japan. Um, Japan has had much less of a stigma about abortion for much longer uh, than we had. If you want to look at the opposite to Japan, you look at the USA. And the USA currently has rising infant mortality and the highest infant mortality rate in the rich world. Uh, recently, the biggest rise in infant mortality and a doubling of the rise in maternal mortality, mums dying in childbirth, was in Texas. And in Texas, about two years ago, uh, the state government took away funding for three quarters of maternity uh, advice in hospitals just before this rise in deaths of mums occurred. And the, the, the rise was much bigger amongst black women than white women in, in Texas. When they were confronted with this, the state authorities said, it's all very complicated, we need a lot of time to study it to see whether these things are related. And that kind of behaviour can occur in an unequal country like the United States, particularly in Texas, a particularly unequal state, where rather than being shamed by the fact that the infant mortality rate has risen and the maternal mortality rate, and it's very obvious why it's risen, and this is connected with the pro-choice lobby and the anti-choice lobby and trying not to let women have any advice about maternity. And the, the reason I'm going on about it is the second country to the United States which behaved in this way is us. When it became obvious that mortality rates in elderly people in Britain had stopped improving, and even to the point now, where of every country in Europe, we're the only one who've had, who've had no increase in life expectancy and a decrease for older people. And the only reason our life expectancy, by the way, isn't decreasing is that we've had an influx of young, healthy people from Europe, right? And that's going to go. When this became obvious in the United Kingdom, the authorities' responses was first, it's influenza and flu, which it wasn't, and it certainly wasn't when it carried on for three years. And then next, oh, it's all very complicated. Um, and it might be complicated. You know, it's, it's a mixture of very large cuts to the NHS, a social security system and a social services system for elderly people that's the right mess, and things like pension of poverty not having fallen since 2010. But it isn't so complicated. I'm sorry, I'm making no pretense at sort of picking people in the order in which they put their hands up. It's entirely random. Um, but if we go with the gentleman in the blue shirt and then the lady with the glasses afterwards. Thank you for the talk. What are the chances that at this point in the game in the UK, this reduction in inequality that we've had in, in recent years is, is the 1% gaming it? Seeing that it is sensible to show some reduction and then let it go down a bit and then hold it so it won't continue to go down. Um, that, uh, okay, I, I don't think people get together and make plans, although, although you may well think, you know, political parties in a sense are kind of doing that. Um, there are some changes that look fairly permanent. So, for instance, Martin Sorrell is the highest paid person in this country, but his pay is about to be cut massively. The boss of WPP, which does the highly social useful thing of advertising worldwide. Um, I suspect that at least in the next 10 years, maybe the next 40 years in real terms, nobody will be paid as much as he was paid uh, in the last couple of years. Again, I think there's some permanent changes going on at the top. My worry is, it's not so much gaming it as there are two ways in which we could go. One way we could go is that we have a hard Brexit, uh, we completely exit from Europe, and we become a kind of treasure island ourselves for the world super rich. Uh, this is terrible news for Guernsey and Jersey and the Isle of Man, because they only exist 
economically because you're not allowed to do here what you're allowed to do there. But imagine if you're allowed to do what you're allowed to do there, here, and we become a play place for the world's billionaires, lowest taxed economy in the world. Then you will see a, a ballooning of inequalities in this country. I suspect the mainland of Europe will in effect erect a wall against this if it were to occur. And I don't believe that we are so stupid that what will directly harm 99.99% of us, you know, becoming vassals to the world super rich in a country that's just designed for them. I don't think we're going to do that, but that's my worry. That's the gaming worry. The other alternative is that it was very expensive allowing the best off 1% to take at its peak 15% of all income. And the next 1% to then take a very large chunk just to try to keep up with them. And the next, it, you have to have a lot of money to do it and you have to be willing for people at the bottom to have very little. And then you have to be willing for people in the middle to have very little. And you have to be willing to allow the number of people who private rent to double in 10 years, which we allowed. And then you have to be willing to have the highest student fees in Europe. And then you have to be willing to have the lowest spending on the National Health Service and decide to cut it even more and begin to privatise it. And the things you have to do to allow the very rich to carry on being very rich begin to creep up and up and up to the point where they now affect people who are in the top 5%, 3%, 2% who are thinking, what are my children going to be able to do in this country? The mad reaction then, and I sometimes see this, is what can I do to get in the 1% then? And you're, you're stuck trying to explain to people that only 1% of you can get in <laughs> to, the, to the 1%. Uh, and this is why I'm optimistic. Um, but there are people out there who really do want us to become the kind of Singapore of Europe, to have guest worker schemes, where labour can come into this country but they can't have children, um, which is what happens in Singapore, um, and we become a play place for the world's extremely wealthy. You know, I, I just don't think we're going to let it happen. So we get this question from the woman in the glasses and the sh sort of flowery shirt, uh, just in the middle here. There. Thank you. Thank you. I am a retired teacher. I have been teaching all around London as a supply teacher. I am very sad about the quality of education. If we improve the quality of education, we can reduce inequality to a great extent. I dare say that. Um, this, uh, where do you take that money off? You take it off the aid. You give it to developing countries without conditions. Autocratic country, countries which oppress their ethnic minorities, which put uh, corrupt uh, money in the pockets of corrupt politicians, in nepotism, yeah. such uh, devious things are happening without conditions. They are getting aid. Yeah. So we can take it off that aid. Thank okay. you. Uh, um, <laughs> I partly, a very large proportion of our, what is it, 0.7% of GDP that goes in aid uh, is, is not going well. It goes in effect to British people um, and organisations. I would want to keep aid at 0.7%, but I would want it distributed in the way that more equal countries, such as Scandinavian countries, distribute their aid, and not the way we do it which is often to help British firms do well in poorer countries, and then we pretend it's aid. Um, and I absolutely agree with you about improving education. And um, one way in which you can increase inequality is by making education worse. So if you wanted to have a more unequal country, you'd introduce grammar schools. You know that, <laughs> because then 80% of children would have to go to a secondary modern. Now, the great news is the Conservatives aren't actually doing this. They're introducing a tiny number of grammar schools with a very small budget because they know it's popular in an enumerate country where people can be told that, don't worry, their children will pass. But even the Conservatives are not thinking of a full return to grammar schools. It's not in their plans or their budgets because they're not that stupid. Can you imagine rolling it out county by county? This is going to be the grammar school. This is the day to the 11 plus. Imagine if you wanted to create a political revolution in Britain, what would actually occur if you, if you did that? But there are people with mindsets who want 
most people to be less well educated because then they can control them. That's why each secondary school in Britain is going to have six teachers less within a year. Because people in charge at the moment think that those children in most schools are not worthy of a better education. And that's a sad fact of how we live. In a normal European country, the vast, vast majority of children go to state schools of one kind or another. You go to school with other children like you. You get to see other people as children. You're not segregated, in many cases, from shortly after birth from the rest of the population. And finally meet them when you turn up at university at 18. What a strange way to behave. It's, they don't have private schools in the rest of this continent in any substantial number. We've become used to it. What is it, 20% in London? Segregation by parents' income? You can't get rid of it immediately. But seeing it as a good thing is a tragedy. Um, and it's a tragedy also for the children who go, not just for the children who don't. But in an unequal country, you can say, oh, but it's a very good education. What, an education where the schools are worried about forcing the highest exam results out of you because the best exam results they can get for their pupils allows them to charge higher fees of next year's parents. And you're cannon fodder to go through that. And what do you get when you finish your private school education? You get to go to St. Russell's Group University as children who've gone to a state school get to go to. Except you're just a little bit less confident because somebody helped you all the way get those grades. Then you turn up at university and in most universities, nobody knows who you are. And somebody's paid for you to have that push into life. Uh, it's, this is the sadness of inequality. It is bad for the rich as well as the poor. Don't envy people with lots of money. Don't envy those who can send their children to boarding schools. Don't envy people who go and get out at Canary Wharf tube station every morning and wear those suits and go into those buildings. There are far better ways to live, and we can go and see them in other places. I'm going to take a few questions from nearer the back, actually, if that's all right. Um, do we have a microphone at the back? Yeah, so if we go with someone actually right next to you, that would be great. Thank you. Um, hey, I, I find your optimism that we're mo moving in the right direction on inequality uh, heartwarming. Um, there's still a few big structural factors, I think, that are, that are pushing us in the other direction, though, and, and one of those is automation, which... Um, you know, has been touted as one of the um, one of the reasons behind Donald Trump's uh, election in the United States, and and you know a big push behind the rise of populism more broadly. And I think that's still got got a long way to go. And you know, there's a lot of a lot of talk about that continuing to replace millions of jobs in all kinds of new, sort of new and unexpected ways. Um, and I guess we'd expect that to be be a strong force to increase inequality as it increases returns on capital um, and and takes away employment from from the working class. So. I guess the question is, do you, do you see automation as being something that could uh, tip us over the edge and, and yeah. go the other way? Okay. Um, again, I, I sound like a broken record on this, I think, about blaming inequality. Um, I grew up in a town in which 40,000 men used to cycle every day to a car plant uh, to work on very loud manual lines to make uh, cars for British Leyland. I still live in that town now, and there were 3,000 people, still mostly men. Uh, the car plant produces more cars than ever. It's automated. It's a wonderful thing that those 37,000 men are no longer doing that horrible job that they were, that were doing because it's been automated. Uh, there are 1,200 robots making most of the cars. Half of the people who are employed there are fixing the robots, and the other half are from Eastern Europe largely, and they're working on the last manual line. Um, this doesn't have to make Oxford a more unequal city. It just makes it a city in which a job you really wouldn't want to do uh, isn't having to be done in a way it was done before. Over what happens in future with this automation, the 1,200 robots in the Cowley plant in Oxford are all built so that they can each fit within a container lorry so that you can move the BMW plant if you want to move the BMW plant. That automation could easily move out of Oxford and move somewhere to a more equal country in Europe. 
that that country won't become more unequal because of the automation. They will simply have well-paid jobs for people looking after the robots there rather than in the city that I live in. Uh, automation, I think, is a wonderful thing. It's similar uh, to when 90% of the population of this country worked on the land. Getting people off working on the land and into industry doesn't have to increase inequality. Making industries more equal increased equality. Uh, we should be very grateful for automation because the alternative to automation is having to do mundane jobs, which are the same. Uh, if, you, if you're on that last manual line in the Cowley Works, every 58 seconds you do the same thing because a car goes past every 58 seconds. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm very in favour of automation. We are completely capable of creating uh, other jobs for ourselves to do. I recently did a talk to eight-year-olds in the school, which was the feeder school for children from that car factory. And I asked the children whether they knew what most um, kids' parents did back when I was at school. And none of the children even knew that this was a school that was built for the car factory, or that almost everybody's father worked in the car factory. All their parents were doing completely different jobs. Many of them actually were cleaners, because this is a poor part of Oxford. Now, you can automate a lot of cleaning, which is what they do in Japan, which is why there are fewer cleaners and better paid cleaners. But you can also employ people to do things that require more imagination, that are, that are more fulfilling to do. And you can look at more equal countries to see where a higher proportion of the population is employed in those jobs. Uh, a last point about cleaning. If you ever want to see a very proud cleaner, go to Japan and watch how the trains are cleaned when they come into Tokyo Central Station. A train comes in, there's a cleaner wearing a bright pink uniform, men and women, but it's bright pink. The cleaner stands at each door of the train. The people come off the train. The cleaners get on the train. The seats, which were built in 1960, mechanically swivel round so that all the space is clear. The cleaners clean the carriage in 12 seconds and get off, salute the train, and the train goes. That's how to clean a train. And you can pay cleaners well to do that. Well, look at how we clean our trains. Look at the person who comes through the train, slowly filling up the bag with stuff that we decided that we want to leave. You see these differences when you travel geographically around. Things that we think are impossible are actually happening in other places now. More questions at the back. Is anyone else? We'll take the gentleman in the pink and blue. And then the woman with the scarf. Uh, you said quite a lot about the motivation of, and behavior of the rich, which I guess is not a surprise to us really, but the behavior of the poor and um, middle classes is a surprise in that it seems the poorer you are, the more you vote to be poorer. Um, well, you can tell I like my graphs. and I, I've got mm. another graph uh, that I'd love to show you at this point. Um, for the richest 19 countries in the world and every of the 50 American states, I've drawn a graph where I have inequality along the bottom and I have turnout at the last election along the y-axis. And it's a wonderful correlation. It's slightly mucked up by Singapore, where you get fined if you don't vote, and Australia. <laughs> but other than, other than Singapore and Australia, the more equal a country, the more people vote. In an unequal country like Britain, uh, the bulk, the majority of the poor simply don't vote. In Brexit, the majority of the poor did not vote. Uh, the majority of Leave voters were actually middle class, um, but a higher proportion of people who did vote were, were Leave voters. So that's the key, that's the most important thing, is the poor don't bother to vote in an unequal country. Um, the second thing then is, in a more equal country, the poor are much less poor. They're very different people. And the middle class and the rich are very different people. And that alters the behavior uh, as well. The other thing you get, of course, is in unequal countries, people with money 
by newspapers and by TV stations and target and target uh, groups of people who matter. And in unequal countries, we also have really weird voting systems. Um, more equal countries, um, apart from Japan, there's always exceptions, but in general, more equal countries have PR, have multiple parties, have a choice. You can really vote for the person you believe in. Imagine that. It's called democracy. Imagine being in a country where there were eight or nine political parties and it didn't matter where you lived in the country, there'd be no need for tactical voting. You actually voted according to your belief. Now, in the United Kingdom, we really have two political parties, two and a half, maybe three. And for most of you, your vote doesn't matter because you don't live in a seat that's going to change. And in the United States, which is more unequal economically, they've only got two political parties. And even when one wins three million votes more than the other one, they have a special kind of democracy. You know, you couldn't make this up, really, could you? I don't know. Yeah? You've got to point. Show me a country in the affluent world with a high degree of economic equality where things are going badly wrong. You know, I wish it was more complicated. Because if it was more complicated, it would be easier to explain how we have ended up in this way. And in a way, it used to be more complicated. In the 1970s and early 80s, when we were more similar, you could have made an argument that said, let the rich get richer, it will benefit all the rest of us, we'll get economic growth and it will allow us to fund the NHS that way. You could have plausibly made that argument in the 70s and 80s. But having tried it and done it, we can now see it doesn't work. So why on earth do we believe people when they tell us again, let the rich get richer and that'll all be okay for you? How long is it going to take? And one reason why people begin to vote in very, very unpredictable ways and move their votes all over is because they've had enough. One reason we got the Brexit vote is that people had two choices. They had a choice between business as usual or something completely different. And the majority had had enough of what was going on and wanted something completely different. The reason why Jeremy Corbyn became leader of the Labour Party is people wanted something completely different. And we don't know what's going to happen on June the 8th, um, but we should be aware that people are far more willing than they were before to vote and behave in different ways to how they've done before. We'll take a question from the lady with the... Um, could you tell us more about the impact of gender inequality? I'm, it's my weakest point, <laughs> I think. I've probably got other weak ones I don't know, of course. Um, but where I've done the least work is, is on gender inequality. Um, there are suggestions that in more equal countries, Scandinavia in particular, you get a higher proportion of electoral representatives uh, who are women rather than men. Um, you get far fairer laws and you get the kind of behaviour uh, where men don't just have paternity leave. If I worked in a university in Norway and I didn't take my paternity leave and look after my baby and I came into work, my colleagues wouldn't speak to me. <laughs> right? And, that, and that, that, kind of, that kind of ethos uh, changes. However, when you look at uh, domestic violence and violence to women, you don't find what you would expect, which is a nice, neat relationship of the more unequal the country, the worse it is to be a woman in. And what we don't know is whether Scandinavian women are far more likely to report being harassed uh, than women in more unequal countries. So it's, it's a really interesting area to look into. Um, the most common form of harassment, 80% of these cases for domestic violence, is hair pulling. Um, and women in Scandinavia, the minute somebody pulls your hair, you have been assaulted. I have a suspicion, just a suspicion, that people are more used to being abused in more unequal countries and don't report that as violence and report more serious violence as violence. Um, but it's where, I'm, it's where I'm weakest on this. I'm going to take two very quick questions, if that's okay. I'll take the gentleman who's been waiting very patiently at the front. And is there a woman, the woman with um, orange hair? Yes. 
There seems to be a growing dichotomy between the, uh, the, the, the wealth in metropolitan areas and in um, depressed areas, both in America mm -hmm. and here. Within the UK context, can you comment on the fact that uh, with uh, HS, HS2 and Crossrail and uh, the expansion of Heathrow, that there's, um, there seems to be a policy of just uh, creating even greater congestion within London mm. as a, and ignoring, um, and th does this cause the populist vote in, in Brexit and in Trump? Um, if, we, if it's okay, we'll take both questions because we're gonna have to wrap up. Um, this is a question about the countries that you, you uh, the more equal countries, I guess. Um, from a UK perspective, at least, countries like Switzerland or, or Norway or Denmark seem very expensive to go and visit. Everyone goes and says it costs so much money yeah. to pay for beer and stuff like that. Is that because we don't understand the value of things here, like you said, with, with cleaners being paid more, or is it something else? Okay. Um, we have the most congestion in Europe. Um, from a, a government, conservative government uh, report in the last year, uh, the worst air quality. So, and it's partly because we don't care about it as much as other countries. Uh, Paris is investing in 200 kilometres of underground line and 60 stations, partly to accommodate all the bankers we're about to get. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> they are they are doing that. Uh, and we have a very London-dominated. Um, way of thinking now, much more than we used to have. We were much less London dominated when we were more equal in the 60s and 70s. Uh, now we think it all has to be about London, hence Heathrow, hence Crossrail, allowing things into London, um, and HS2. Um, and I think that's a, a symptom of, of these things. Um, I mean, the fact we're even worse than the United States with deaths from air pollution. You know, you are perfect guinea pigs. You might think that the air is being filtered in this room. But the air that you've been breathing in this room and the air you'll breathe when you go out in a few minutes' time is you know, the dirtiest air, I think, in any rich country in the world. <laughs> and the government tried to cover it up, and thankfully the courts have made and released it. The WHO produced a report today saying it's the worst air. Uh, the expense. Yeah, people always comment on the expense. Um, and again, this is an area I'd love to look at. I've got two answers, and I'll stop. Uh, almost anecdotal answers. You can get different ways of behaving. Uh, I went, I had dinner with a friend and our combined children in Switzerland a few years ago. And this dinner just consisted of some melted cheese and a few other things. But during this dinner, the chef came out and, and shook all our hands. And the waiter was all smiley and everybody else was incredibly happy. And I thought, what a wonderful country. Everybody, you know, even the person washing up the dishes came and said hello. And then we got the bill. <laughs> <laughs> and... Of course they like their jobs. <laughs> um, and I, I'm, I suspect it was, you know, very special cheese, and, you know, and it was a great thing. My friend is a very well-paid top clinical professor in Switzerland. He only goes and eats out once a month. You value eating out. That's one message. But the other message, you don't have to go the Swiss way. Uh, you can eat out the way they still eat out in Greece, where it is normal to eat out and not necessarily to cook for yourself because... You can cook food more efficiently in a restaurant than in a kitchen at home as long as you're seeing your customers more like your friends and fellow citizens and not people to make a profit out of. And then the cost of the food, particularly after the crisis in Greece, the cost of eating out in Greece actually plummeted. Became, so you can have a country in which it's cheap to eat out, but you have to see other people like yourselves and you're not just trying to make a profit or you can have fancy high polluted dining, but you can only have it infrequently. What you cannot have is what we have in London, the kind of eating out we have in London, and have an equal society at the same time, and have happy people in the kitchens, washing up, working as, as waiters and waitresses and so on. That isn't possible. But we have lots of choices if we head towards the more equal route. It isn't one way, it's not uniformity, but you're not going to, be able to live the life of Riley if you're in the top 10% of society in a more equal country. Part of the reason of greater equality is that you can't treat other people as disposable in a more equal place. You actually have to, to consider what they do. And when they change your sheets in the hotel, when they feed you, when they look after your children, you have to treat them 
as you would like them to treat you. And you have to think of them as human beings. And that's what we've stopped doing. And that's what we're going to slowly have to learn again. And that takes a generation uh, to do. Thank you very much.